Hey, people. How's it going? How is it going? Welcome to the first of the late night stream. It's not the first, but the first official one. And I've decided what we're going to be playing out tonight. And probably for a while. A World in Economica, episode one. Uh, it will be put on YouTube. The video will be put on YouTube, uh, hopefully very soon. So there will be no, no. Um, let me actually even stop the music and minimize this. There you go. There will be no extra music other than in-game sounds. Um, it's going to be no cam. No uh, Twitter logo or anything like that here or on the screen. No, just basically the two icons that you see on the screen in the corners now for the Indie Army stream team and the AGN. That is basically it and the game. So, um, I do plan on making this. If not something that I do normally, something that I plan on doing at least maybe three times a week if not try to do it each day um i cannot tell you when college will interfere with that unfortunately i do not know exactly if it's going to interfere too heavily with the uh too heavily with my current schedule i do know that i won't be able to do many of the long streams that i want to do will try to stream at least three times a week while I'm when college starts back up definitely will try again three times a week see am I still in the yes I am still in the raid call so if you want to get in there and you know do that whole thing again you can my bot should be in the channel so if you type in exclamation point raid call that it should give you the link yep it gives you the ID and tells you where to get it if you don't already have it and want to if you don't want to you don't have to but let's get on with the world in economica shall we um, let's see here hello and good evening or good morning wherever you at wherever you're at and we shall do it in English no. all right slate in the past people really believed that there was a doorway to an alternate world let me start that over in the past People really believed that there was a doorway to an alternate world on the dark side of the moon. The dark side could not be seen from Earth, and it was only a few decades ago that images were successfully taken of it. However, just as Earth had been mapped, visited, and divested of all its mysteries and secrets, it was made painfully clear that there were no rabbits on the moon, no traces of aliens, and certainly no pieces of portals to alternate worlds. This was perhaps why the journey through the vastness of space to the dark side of the moon was so fascinating for me when my parents took me there as a kid. Mankind had never set upon any of the glittering stars that were arrayed before me. When that realization hit, I had felt a desire to leave my footprints where no one had gone before. It wasn't until after I learned more about the world that it dawned on me what a foolhardy dream that was. Regardless, it was something that shook me so much to my core that I nearly wet my pants. <laughs> Afterwards, everything before me became a stepping stone in my mind, something my, in my mind towards my dream of setting foot where no one had gone before. I had no time to waste. If I didn't act now, then someone else would leave their footprints there first. Faster. Faster. Much faster. The population continued to grow and time ruthlessly slipped away. 
Only a handful could be the vanguard of it all. Not a day went by that I wouldn't consider what I would see at that moment. It would be a new frontier where familiar places, customs, and the past would not exist. A frontier where every small movement I made would become part of history. The footprints of the first humans on the moon could still be found preserved in the Sea of Tranquility Memor- Memo- Oh God. The footprints of the first humans on the moon could still be found preserved in the Sea of Tranquility Memorial Hall. Those footprints told uncountable tales. Footprints left in the sand, measuring just sh- just shy of 30 inches. However, they were amazing footprints that shent shivers down my spine. With a click, the mobile PC turned on. I awoke when I heard the whirring of the hard drive. However, since I had slept curled up in my chair while clutching my PC, it was difficult to will my body to move. My body felt so stiff I was sure that a careless motion would break something. Even so, I rather enjoyed the sensation of slowly stretching out my limbs from this cramped position after waking up. It made me feel alive and truly let me know that I was awake. I wheeled my arms to move and then my legs. Although hardly efficient, this was how I chose to do things and what happened when I woke up every morning. It was a satisfying action and one I had never had a chance to savor before I left home. On top of the table, I had left my rather crude diode lamp on, and a coarse layer of fat had formed on the surface of the leftover coffee in my dirty cup. Beside my cup was a half-eaten chocolate bar, which I reached for and crammed into my mouth. I swallowed the unpleasantly sweet chunk as the PC finished booting up. At that moment, my brain went to work as I verified that I had my wallet, memory cards, and bag on me, and that none of it had been stolen while I was asleep. It appeared that I had survived the previous night. Only then did I breathe a sigh of relief. However, in order for me to survive today, I'd have to make some money. It had been three months and twelve days since I left home. Telling myself that I wasn't just some well-to-do kid pretending to be a ruffian, I flipped open the organic display. I was staying in a cheap neck cafe. It was a good-for-nothing establishment that leached Wi-Fi from another shop, and its customers were of equally a questionable quality. Hey kid, a fine morning, isn't it? As I left the booth to go wash my face, an unkempt clerk greeted me as he played a game at the corner, at a counter. I figured he was be so much I figured he wasn't so much being friendly as making sure. I knew that he was watching me. The only entrance and exit were next to the counter and off to the side on the wall were the words, Everyone Pays. Music's too loud a bit. How about now? How about now, Slade? Too loud, good, a little bit more, good now, okay. And you can still clearly hear the music. It's not like my voice drowns out the music. Like I said, this is a new setup, so I'm not exactly sure how well it's uh, going to look. Does not look very good stretched out like that. Okay. The only entrance and exit were next to the counter, and off to the side of the wall were the words, Everyone pays, no freeloaders. Even though this sad excuse for a building was built in a sewage canal, money was always collected.
The only thing that concerned me when I left home was finding a place to sleep. Though I had some money, I couldn't really change my appearance. <clears throat> a fine morning? I'm not fond of your sarcasm, Earth Dog. At my retort, the clerk's face twisted into a smile. Uh huh. It is unfortunate to know what a real morning looks like, since the weather here is just a computer program. He said that lightly as he returned his gaze to his game. He seemed to be from Earth, though I wondered if he came to the moon as unskilled labor, got fired, and ended up here as an outcast of some sort. Why don't you head on back to Earth then? In my words, he turned briefly to glance at me and laughed sarcastically. <laughs> things are bet things are a bit better here than down there anyway. And that's how the clerk responded. Moon scum. Without responding, I went to the washroom. My name's Yoshiharu Kawaura. I was born and raised in this lunar city, so I was genuine moon scum. I returned to my booth, entered my password, and booted up the tool application on my computer. A welcome screen, whose only good point was its friendliness, was followed by a merciless and desolate landscape, much akin to the surface of the moon. Countless lines of words flickered on the screen. I imagine it's the kind of effect you'd get if you took a picture of the undeveloped part of the moon's surface with a low-res camera. Uh, the screen showed a session of the lunar stock, lunar stock, lunar stock exchange. This was the kind of place for moon scum like me to make a living. I'd get rich without needing to break a sweat. I didn't have enough time to earn an honest living. I took a deep breath and went about business. Downward revision for the first fiscal quarter of CK Bio. Possibility of an investigation into Emerald Industries over suspicions of collusion. Regarding inflation, the board of directors at the Lunar Central Bank. With one eye on the stream of news, I focused on managing 220 stocks, picking up those with large price fluctuations. <clears throat> for instance, if one stock had moved 10% 10 slash percent, I'm going to say 10%, 10% on the previous day, and another had moved 1%, there was probably a high chance that the stock that moved 10% could move by 1% today. I would trade it on that notion alone. Putting into consideration the mood of the market based on the news, I would buy stocks with large fluctuations within the turbulent up and down movement of the price. I could extract some profit, which is what I occupied myself with between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. lunar time. Between those hours, the only things that went into my mouth were food that I could eat one-handed and drinks. And to be honest, I'd be so engrossed in trading that breaks were uncommon. If I had the free time to take a break, I'd rather use it to look at my screen and grasp price fluctuations, even just a little, to do some trades. After all, a difference of a few minutes when making the call to buy or sell could easily mean the difference between gaining or losing 1 or 2 percent. My war chest was 72,000 moles. Mules. 1 percent of that came out of 700 mules. A store clerk here would make seven mules an hour at best. This was a place where a public school teacher's monthly starting salary was 1,200 mules. So I could make, a few, make in a few minutes what they'd make in a month. Of course, over the course of a day's trading, some people would win and others would lose. But I was on a winning streak of all streaks and my seed money of a thousand mules had ballooned to 72 times that before I knew it. So the one and only time I did honest, hard labor in my life was to build that seed money. Since then, I had just been building my assets through these trades. While the gains were a little less than what they used to be, the greater your assets grew, the faster they grew. So it didn't worry me. It'd be what they call a snowball effect. I had never seen snow before, but I would seen videos of Earth before, and thus I'm familiar with it. I had decided that I was going to make even more money and then live in the center of this lunar city. It's a place where tons of ridiculously smart people were gathered. It's said that 70% of this world's wealth was held by the people there. I'd live it up there and then... Then... 
the back of my head was high on these kinds of delusions as I performed trade after trade like a man possessed. That's why it took me a while to notice. Notice. I finally did after I got smacked on the head. Yo, kid. I turned around to see that clerk standing in front of the booth's open door. What, you want money? Since when did this place become prepay? Or what, was it something else? Was it making money not allowed here? What do you want? I'm busy. As I glared at him, the overly skinny, bleary-eyed clerk let out a tired sigh. <sighs> That's your reply? I came to tell you that the police are on their way to gather up street urchins, and before the clerk finished his sentence, my PC had been closed and thrown into my bag. Hey, wait! The employee grabbed my shoulder as I tried to push him aside and exit the booth. Though he was thin, he was still muscular, strong enough to remind you that he was an adult. Still, I always kept a set amount of money in my breast pocket for times like this. I grabbed it and thrust it into his hands. Keep the change! I put on my hat, shouldered my bag, and ran down a narrow corridor. Wondering what was going on in the booth, a bunch of guys, who looked like they just mumbled the useless replies to any police questioning, peeked through the cracks from their booths, wondering if someone had been arrested. After sliding past the dirty counter, I made it to the store's even filthier exit. The chipped away paint and rust made the already cramped building feel even more claustrophobic. I ran straight down the hallway towards the open air. There were stairs if I turned left at the end of the hall, but I had never had any plans to use them in the first place. Without a moment's hesitation, I kicked off the floor, jumping as high as I could. Passing over the concrete wall, my body flew out over the street. Because the cafe was on the fifth floor of the building, there was a heck of a view below me. I jumped towards the wall of the building opposite me and then kicked off from that wall aiming back towards the wall of the first building. Once the sole of my foot hit a pipe on the wall, I jumped straight up with all of my strength and resolve. Human genes have been fine-tuned for living on Earth over millions of years, so with some weight training, anyone could perform feats like these on the moon, where the gravity was lower. What you couldn't do, though, was to allow yourself to miss your daily training. Jumping from wall to wall, I quickly reached the 14th floor of the building next door. And I guess my heart rate did go up a bit. I glanced down to see a pair of blue and uniformed policemen looking bored as they tapped their batons on their shoulders and climbed the stairs. It seemed that clerk wasn't playing a prank on me when he gave me that tip. I already paid my thanks to him, though, when I handed him that money. By now, he should have probably have already used the change to kick back with a store-bought beer. For the moment, I opened my bag in the hallway and flipped open my PC screen. I ran off in the middle of a trade, and so my position hadn't changed. I should be able to get at least a weak wireless connection out here. If I were lucky, prices would have risen and I'd be home free. But usually at times like this... Ugh, figures. After hanging my head in disappointment, I closed out my losing positions and called it for a day. Nothing good could come from wandering around downtown in the middle of the day. After jumping from one building to the next, I decided to walk down the deserted hallway towards my favorite Chinese restaurant. It was a time of day when most people my age would be at school, so walking around carelessly would get you chased down by the cops before you knew it. Until you turned 18, the legal age here, it was mandatory that you belong to some sort of educational institution. Some people would say that this was a good thing, while others grumbled something about government-funded programs. I fell into neither camp. My way of dealing with systems I didn't like was to quietly escape them, not too loudly, not to loudly criticize them. On that note, this area, with all of its complicated passages and extreme elevation changes, is not odd to see the seventh floor of one building be next to the basement of another was convenient for people like me. Not to mention the overgrown veg vegetation here and there act that acted as good cover. These plants weren't originally included in the city plans, but leaked out of one of the many lunar lab laboratories where they were messing with their genes. Hey, Tuna Den. Welcome to the stream. 
Supposedly, genes had tons of factors that expressed themselves differently depending on the environment. So a lot of plants and animals start acting strangely as soon as they were brought to the moon. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. Though are even people saying that life forms on Earth could have originated from outer space and brought to Earth via the moon. Hey, Dark Lunar Dude, how you doing? Welcome to the stream. Hope you enjoy yourself. Some of these plants grew so well on the moon's inorganic. Oh. Some of these plants grew so well on the moon's inorganic matter that you might wonder if they've been around here for a million years. Of course, it wasn't as if these plants were free from the laws of physics. Nitrogen and other nutrients for them were often brought over from Earth, so I hadn't heard about any worries that the surface of the moon would be taken over by greenery. This applied to more than just plants. As for the humans here, it didn't matter how many ultra-elite think tanks came to energize the lunar economy and its industries. Life here just wasn't sustainable without sending a lot of things over from Earth. According to the government statements, even if the orbital elevator were to stop moving today, there was currently enough biomass here to create an enclosed recycling-based environment. In other words, We'd be able to eat food, crap it out, and then use that crap to grow more food to eat, and so on. Hey Chocobo, welcome to the stream, haven't seen you for a while buddy. How you been? How you been? They'd be, in, they'd be able to make a ton of electricity with solar panels while collecting direct sunlight to use as a super hot source of heat. So maybe they're right. I mean, people even say that Earth was in more danger environmentally since they're still relying on oil and nuclear power. I didn't know who was right. Whatever the case, I had dreams, and if it meant making my dreams come true, I didn't care if I was on Earth or the moon. After all, my dream was to stand on the forefront of humanity. It'd be a place where you could only look forward and live by advancing onward. Who cared about what happened to the world behind you? I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you've been doing good. Glad you've been doing good. It'd be a place where you go, who cared about what happened to the world behind you. And if I couldn't make this dream come true, then there'd be no reason for me to live. That was why, to put it logically, I'd never worried a single bit about the moon's environment or whatever. What I worried about was how much money I made and how fast I reached my goals. <laughs> you never did find the Chocobo quest, huh? That's sad. Uh, you'll eventually find it, I know you will. Eventually. While I was thinking about these things, I passed through the thickly vegetated tunnel to high ground. It was a clear day, as it always was. On the other side of a translucent membrane, the visible half of the mist-covered Earth looked small. The sky over the lunar city was wrapped in a see-through dome, and right beyond it was outer space. The gravity was weak on the moon, so you couldn't naturally keep large amounts of gases stored up on the surface. How many hours into this, or how many hours into... Are you talking, about, are you are you talking to me or to the lunar? <laughs> So they couldn't naturally keep large amounts of grass stored up on the surface. Me, I'm not even an hour in. Um, let me do up, up, not yep, up, time. Yeah, I, I'm not even half an hour in. So. Uh, also, while apparently each 24-hour day on Earth had a morning, afternoon, and night which was followed the next day by another morning, the moon alternated between two week days and two week nights. However, the human body cycle was set differently, thanks to tens of thousands of years of living on Earth. Because most of the people living on the moon were immigrants from Earth, its dome was adjusted to give off light in an Earth-like way. Also, it had sprinklers attached to it so that it even rained. However, I'd only seen things like downpours and thunderstorms and videos. When it rained here, it was always just a drizzle. Strong winds never blew here. The only winds felt here were the slow, coiling movement of the atmosphere due to centrifugal and Coriolis forces. 
as well as the gentle breeze of the air inside the dome being mechanically circulated. I strayed from the street onto a grass-covered cliff and jumped upward with a grunt. I kicked off of a tree branch, rotated my body to land on the top of the tunnel. This was a box seat where you could look down on the greater part of the city. I grabbed some beef jerky out of my bag and bit into it. According to the guys who came from Earth, this wasn't at all close to the real thing, but it's the only beef jerky I knew. Okay. Oh, nice. Nice. Very nice. There were a number of cities on the moon. The one I lived in was the very first city to be created, and I could get a clear view of the whole thing from here. The spot in front of me were pointed skyscrapers sprung upward, one after the other. The spot in front of me were pointed skyscrapers sprung upward, one after the other, was called Newton City. It wasn't like entry was regulated. However, it had the feel of a special zone where only certain people could enter. Since it was full of giant corporate buildings, even public places like shopping malls and parks were overrun with police and city regulations. Most wealth here was created in Newton City, and you could find famous tycoons with assets worth over 10 billion mools all over the place. If you had that much wealth, you'd undoubtedly be able to be on the forefront when humanity took its next step. Money could make just about any desire you might have in this world come true. In this world, money ruled all. Like a photograph of the moment a drop of liquid hit a pool of water, a group of skyscrapers stood in the dead center of Newton City, while the buildings around that area were suddenly much shorter. That area was where middle-class people who worked in Newton City lived, called Green City, or the White Belt. It was a place full of people who loved words like high society and refinement, the kind of people who claimed to care about grace and harmony, but were really full of nothing but pride and obsessions with upward mobility. Whenever I went there, I felt sick seeing the sterilized rows of small, nicely manicured lawns and white-walled buildings. There wasn't a single piece of garbage on the streets, and the only plants around were, domestica were domesticated trees on the roadside. After that, the buildings in the area around Green City got taller again, but it was a complete jumble. There, power lines dangled messily into the streets, and vulgar neon signs lit the area, painting the whole place with a fill of squalor. The area was called the Outer Sections, and while technically they'd all been numbered from 1 to 8, there was no real point. If you considered Newton City the center of everything, the north was full of factories. There, you could find silicon dioxide dissolution factories, fertilizer synthesis factories, automated plantations, and so on. On the east side was the village where I lived. The area was notorious for its hard-nosed residents. You could also find settlements of old-timers whom you might call artisans in the area, which made for a countless number of small workshops. Most people didn't have the luxury of being able to do something like transport wooden furniture via orbital elevator, and land was expensive on the moon, so the houses of Green City were small. As a result, handmade furniture created with the size and shape of your house in mind was far more popular than ready-made furniture. Came with water this time. <laughs> I was told that my parents were aiming to live together with plants brought from Earth in exchange for making furniture out of wood. Even though factories existed that used the best scientific advances to maximize harvest rates as much as physically possible, they still grew plants by hand for some reason. They seemed to at least have their customers, but I didn't see a single enjoyable thing about being covered in dirt. It just made me wonder why they even came to the moon in the first place. This wasn't a place for stuff like that. The moon was supposed to be a place where you directed your gaze to the top of the inorganic buildings that lined Newton City. And if I shifted my eyes to the left, I saw an area haunted by those who couldn't keep up in that struggle. 
here, when buildings started rusting, no one would bother to repaint them and had been nicknamed the Red Valley. The reason it was called a valley was because when Newton City was originally built on a flat crater floor, all the low-income earners made the Rocky Mountains surrounding the city their home. And by Rocky Mountains, I don't quite mean something like the harsh mountainous environments you might find on Earth. I was act it was actually close to what you might call highlands. As a result, the rock was chipped away to increase surface area, like a river eroding hills, and many, and many structures could be built in a tight area by terracing the slopes. Furthermore, more space was secured by digging caves into the rocky stretch stretches. Only, as was clearly evident, doing this over and over made for a mess of a city. Not much more than a decade had passed since the city's establishment and had already been such a devilish haunt that you wouldn't blame the local government if they just threw up their hands and gave up. As for me, I liked the Red Valley with this level of squalor. While it was true that the people living there could be called outcasts and failures, the place was irresponsible in a good way, and that put me at ease. Of course, I had no intentions of becoming the 20% that lived there. And finally, the area around where I was right now was called the Sixth Outer Section. It wasn't as degenerate as the Red Valley, but it's not quite as productive as the east side of town. This area didn't even have a nickname yet, and its lackadaisical aspects oozed out at every turn. It's getting late for you, Slade. All right, you get your rest, Slade. Uh, your watch till you fall asleep. Well then, thank you. I appreciate your view. This area didn't even have a nickname yet, and its lackadaisical aspects oozed out at every turn. Alright, Slade. While the buildings were dirty and worn out, it was dotted with small companies who dreamed of Newton City and the occasional decent-looking house, so it was not the worst place to live. I stood up, hopped back down to the street, and jogged off. The road was paved with neatly shaved limestone rocks. It was chipped and cracked here and there, but no one ever tried to patch it. The rough dirt of the moon had piled up in its recesses. Waterways were occasionally visible, and in them you could see clear running water as well as fish swimming. While hydrogen was available in the moon, there was no water. So once hydrogen had been synthesized into water, it was made sure that every drop remained circulating within the dome. Uh, the waterway's final destination was the giant water processing plant under Newton City. In other words, everything was designed to gather in the center of the mortar-shaped mortar city, whether it's people, water, or wealth. From there, everything was disseminated... outward. After crossing the intricate waterways and bridges, I passed through a narrow alley and reached my destination. It was called the Lunar Chinese Restaurant. It's run by a Chinese husband and wife with a strong spirit of enterprise who emigrated to the moon. I could say here, I could sit down here from early afternoon to whenever and they wouldn't say a word. However, the elderly wife's health had been fading recently, and the woman who sometimes worked at the restaurant in their place was a bit of a pain. While I prayed that she wouldn't be there today, it was in vain, especially on an un unlucky day already full of policemen and stock losses. As I opened the frosted glass door, the woman, watching the television placed near the ceiling with her head resting in her arms propped up on the counter, lowered her glance listlessly. As I was overcome with the urge to just shut the door and go to another store, the woman raised her voice before I got the chance. Table for one! The kitchen was run by a silent, stubborn, elderly husband of the family, so he never showed any signs of affection. Of course, no reply came from the kitchen. Even so, it was too late to leave, so I entered the store with a heavy gait and set up camp in a corner seat. While mountains of hydrocarbons sat in the moon's poles, they couldn't be used for luxuries such as making plastic. As a result, most of the store's equipment was made from either wood or iron. Both could be gathered on the moon and were easily decomposable by microbes when thrown away. 
An iron cup was placed with a clang on my tattered wooden table, which was no doubt found in a dump somewhere. The woman, beaming, then poured me water from high up. The water seemed like it should splash out, but it all stayed in the now perfectly filled cup. You showed up, you delinquent. Crab omelet over fried rice. I made my order bluntly without a proper reply. The woman was about 20 years old and had bright, healthy hair. She had been working here for a while and seemed to know a lot of the customers, and so she probably lived in the area. One crab fried! The woman yelled cheerfully towards the kitchen. Then, of course, the woman she... Then, of, then of all the things she could have done, she sat down across from me. The woman cheerfully yelled towards the kitchen, and then, of all the things she could have done, she sat, she sat down across from me. Okay. That was weird. <laughs> the line must have been copied twice. It was, in fact, it's two different versions of the same line. In fact, they're both grammatically correct. Well, actually, no. No, this one's not. It might be under certain situations, but I'm pretty sure that this one isn't. The second one is not. It's not grammatically correct. But the first one is. Except for her body was off to the side and her vision was fixed on the TV. As she seemed interested in some plot point in the drama she was watching. I heard that actor there is in an area right now. He's going to negotiate his next title and bask in space at the same time. A beautiful actress from around here is accompanying him. I didn't ask, but she informed me anyway. I ended up glancing at the, at the screen as I silently took my PC out of my bag. He's a little too handsome, though. Now that might be true. I stifled my urge to reply with a so what as I placed my PC on the table and switched it on. The PC was loaded up with financial information and charts of historical prices for the 4,000 stocks on the Lunar Stock Exchange. In order to make a profit tomorrow, I had to find my next target. Oh? You want to use our power? I raised my glance after being asked the question and found my eyes meeting the woman's. She had beautiful almond-shaped eyes that were even brighter in color than her hair. She must have led an easy life, I thought to myself. Nevertheless, it'd be helpful if I could use the restaurant's electricity. Even if I did decide to go back to that half-assed net cafe, the rates were cheaper at night. The problem was that my battery might not last until then. I silently took out my adapter and plugged, in, plugged it into the court that the woman, still seated, had lazily dragged my way with her foot. As I hugged the ground in order to plug my adapter into the outlet, the woman mischievous, mischievously twitched the toes in her sandals. Perv. That was what she said to me once I raised my head, but she wasn't even wearing a skirt. Naturally, I ignored it and booted up my PC. After that, the woman stopped messing with me and the only sounds in the restaurant were the filtered voices from the television and the swinging pots in the kitchen. This was a quiet area without much foot traffic and it felt like time passed slowly here. A thing that made me go far out of my way to come here, other than the fact that they wouldn't report me to the cops, was this tranquility. What'd you eat yesterday? Well, it was pretty tranquil until the woman suddenly asked me a question. What did I- what? Did what I had to eat yesterday have anything to do with you? I ignored her as I stared at my screen, but she wouldn't stop looking at me. Her face, visible from the corner of my eye, didn't make it look like she was particularly interested in the question, but she wouldn't turn away. Defeated, I raised my glance, and at that moment she grinned, and I'm taking a drink of water.
pasta. I answered and then turned back to my screen. I updated my data while I was in the cafe, so I searched for any corporate news that might affect the market in the next few days. From where? As I clicked my tongue, the woman's smile, as expected, disappeared. She didn't get mad or stand up, though. That doesn't suit you, you know. She said this so seriously that instead of getting mad, I ended up blushing. She's treating me like a complete child. Big Bull Cafe. It was an arrogantly named place for a nearly illegal operation. You see, bulls were symbols of strong markets. For that reason, there are bronze bulls placed in front of the biggest financial districts in the world, like America's Wall Street or the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So for me, the place was good luck. Huh, so Seralt's handmade pasta. Seralt? Wasn't there a real skinny guy there? That guy owns the place. Owns the... I was a little heartbroken at those words. I was sure that he was just some loser who worked there by the hour, but to be the owner of a store, big or small, was a fine example of a capitalist. Not only that, I was heartbroken to hear that I was eating his pasta. I mean, it was good. I taught him how to make those. The woman beamed with pride. Wait, if she taught him, then where did they know each other from? Don't tell me they used to be lovers. As I dreamed up juicy scenarios in my head, I stared vacantly at her face, at her face, and she turned back to the television. So, what was lunch? Dinner? Hmm? Did you eat that for lunch or dinner? I didn't have the slightest idea as to why she was asking for all these details. It was probably some stupid made-for-woman horoscope that she watched every day. I bet it was something like, if you ask a boy you meet today what and where he ate for each meal yesterday, your lucky color is yellow, and your lucky word is optimism. Dinner. What about lunch? I set out to click my tongue, but after being told straight faced that it didn't suit me, I ended up holding back. The woman might have noticed this fact because she was grinning slightly. I answered her, telling her that my mind to shut up. I didn't eat anything. Really? This time, I didn't keep myself from clicking my tongue or from getting angry for that matter. Why she wanted to know these things in such detail completely baffled me. And what do you care? Right as I turned her question around on her, a plate of fried rice hit the counter with a thud. Same thing again. with the second being more grammatically correct. Right as I returned the question, uh, right as I turned her question around on her, right as I returned the question, hmm, the plate of fried rice hit the counter with a thud. The woman stood up and brought the plate over. Then, right as I thought she was going to place it on the table, she kept the plate in her hand and looked down at me. You really didn't eat anything for lunch? As if to show her that I was trying my hardest to click my tongue, I started to scrape my upper lip with my teeth. No, I didn't. I don't eat lunch on weekdays. What about today? Ugh, today is an exception since I was driven out of the cafe at a weird time. And so what, anyway? And anyway, give me my food that you're just holding there. Eating a proper lunch was something special to me since I usually only did it on Sundays when the Lunar Stock Exchange was closed. Eating lunch on a weekday was rare. As I glared at the woman, she heaved a small sigh and placed the plate on the table completely unperturbed. The smell of the sweet and sour sauce wet my appetite. My interest shifted from the now strangely annoying woman's questions to the food in front of me. You need to eat three proper meals a day. And the woman talked to me while standing and staring at me digging into the fried rice. And eat a little more neatly. Mind your own business, I muttered mentally as I piled a mountain of fried rice and crab omelet on my spoon and shoved it all in my mouth. The woman sighed and returned listlessly to her counterside chair. What a cryptic, stupid woman. If I focused on my food, stuffing my stomach with such vigor that I 
I focused on my food, stuffing my stomach with such vigor that I barely had time to even sigh. After filling my stomach with fried rice, I ordered the IU jelly, a sweet and sour gelatinous dish. It was unusual to see this dessert around here, but it was definitely delicious, if a little expensive. However, today was a cursed day, and I thought it might be just the exorcism I needed. You've got the money, right? The woman doubted me after I made my order, but of course I had enough money to have a regular meal. You could rent a cheap apartment for 400 mules a month, so I could live on my own pretty easily. The reason I actually couldn't was because there wasn't any places a miner with no guarantee guarantor could actually rent. I heard that on Earth, people in my situation were sometimes able to make it happen. Unfortunately, lunar cities were only accessible via orbital elevator, and so everyone's identity was known. If I went to rent a house, they'd immediately run my fingerprints and an iris scan, and then contact my parents. Unless you were an extraterrestrial, if you're on the moon, they know who you are and where you came from. Have I ever stuffed you? Have I ever stiffed you? Just because you've paid in the past doesn't mean that you're sure to pay next time. And anyway, you ran away from home, right? You need to take care, better care of your money. I felt a strange sense of comfort in the fact that her lecture wasn't about my running away itself. And overall, I agreed with the idea that people should take care of their money. Don't have to tell me that. Oh, really? The woman shrugged, then carried the IU jelly from the counter where it just appeared. It was hard to argue with her since I was, in fact, wasting money here, but I was confident that I had more money than anyone else my age. What's more, I had never gone on a wild spending spree before. The magic of compound interest made the world go round. If one mule today could be could turn turned into ten in a year, then three years after that it'd be ten thousand. Compared to that compare that to what my dad would make in his entire life, Earning roughly the same amount every month from sweating in the fields to grow vegetation, in five years there'd be no way I'd be eating in a lame restaurant like this. That woman might be making fun of me now, but I'll bet I'd eventually be wearing a stylish suit and living in a high-rise apartment in Newton City. And of course, I wasn't going to stop there. That wasn't where my dream ended. It's where it would begin. If you're some if you're some rich actor, you might be able to bask in space on the opposite side of the moon with some beautiful woman by your side. But if you were one of the wealthiest here in Lunar City, you could go even further. You can make all the emotions and desires you feel when you look up at space come true. I ate the sweet and sour clump of Ayu jelly, and then as I looked at my screen to choose the tree that would grow me money, I got immersed in a familiar daydream. This place was the forefront of humanity. A golden city of wealth and prosperity. I'd run through the city's gates. I'd outwit the geniuses and prodigies from Earth to take my place there at last. I silently got myself worked up during this quiet early afternoon in a Chinese restaurant. Only, as I was moving my touchpad mouse back and forth, and just as I brought up the display for the prominent, even on the moon, investment bank E.J. Rockbird, customers entered the store. I thought it was strange that customers would come in at this hour and raise my head. Oh, sh hey. Hey. There you go. I thought it was strange that customers would come in at this hour and raise my head. Welcome. Two, please. Yes, sir. Table for two. The woman said this in her usual carefree voice but the words barely entered my ear. I lowered my cap even further over my eyes and hunched over, trying to hide in, my, in the reflection of my PC display. Looking at their clothes, it was unmistakable. The pair who had just arrived at the table, at the table on the other side of the restaurant were police officers on patrol. <laughs> I'll get the tension done. The same here. Very well. Two tension. It seemed... Tension. <laughs> Tension. Can you feel the tension? <laughs> it seemed like they just chose this place randomly during their patrol, but who likes eating in the same restaurant as the cops? Not only that, I think these two, those two were the ones who were at the Big Bull Cafe, according to my faint memory. The patrol 
route for the police didn't include going into cafes, so someone had to have tipped them off somehow. I was not I, it, I was not some sort of invisible man, so someone surely must have seen me hanging around a weird place at a weird time. Whoever that someone was, if they told the police that there was a shady-looking kid around, there'd only be a handful of places they shir- they'd search. It was totally possible that those two were looking for me. That might also be the reason that the policeman was facing me. Policeman facing me was glancing at me every now and then. But to think that he'd take off and lead us on a wild goose chase! The policeman with his back to me suddenly spoke up. The cop looking at me waited a moment before replying to his partner. Well, it was just some big shots looking at maps all day who decided how wide our area of jurisdiction was to be, and there wasn't any public survey system in that area either. But I think that if he were hiding somewhere, it would have been in that net joint. The storekeeper there was a pretty sketchy looking guy, too. Maybe we should grab him and rough him up a little. Don't judge by appearances. He ended up having a pretty impressive history, didn't he? Yeah, I guess. Man, I should have studied harder at the academy. I never thought I'd be assigned to the boonies like this. Location has nothing to do with it. You just need to carry out your duties. Yeah, you're right about that. So they were looking for someone. But the owner, that Seralt guy, had an impressive history? Couldn't even begin to imagine. What do we do after this? What do we do after this? If we go by the book, we'd start the usual thing with questioning people. His co-worker, facing me, took a sip of water. Which I should do right now, actually. Hey, Mrs. Anya Six, how you doing? Oh, I love my bot. <laughs> His co I got the feeling that he was taking a good hard look at me. In my mind, I was praying that they gave up on the questioning and just went back to their nest. If we call in for reinforcements, we're just going to get laughed at. Looks like we've got no choice. Anyway, our duty is to keep public order. Cracks in public display begin in the smallest places. Even if it's just one boy, we can't just let him get away. My heart felt like it might just jump out of my mouth. Now there was no mistake. They were tipped off by someone and were looking for me. Lunar cities were nuts about keeping public order. Even in the Red Valley, where suspicious guys wandered the streets, there was not even the faintest trace of any real danger. It was just a degenerate, pleasure-seeking town. Everyone knew just how risky committing an act of physical violence was in a place this small. After all, if you were deported by the residential management court, there'd be no question that you'd never be able to come back. And the only people exempt from that form of punishment were people who were born on the moon. Even then, if you committed second-degree murder or worse, it wasn't so certain. Of course, I wouldn't be subject to the penal code just because I ran away from home, but the overall zeal for maintaining public order would mean that I'd be sent back home. After that, I'd probably be forced to report to a local facility every day until I became an adult. While that happened, I'd grow further and further away from the front line of the world and would eventually be swallowed up by the masses. I fixed my darting eyes on my hands and thought desperately, how should I escape from here? If I grabbed my PC and ran, the plug would get in the way. Do I just unplug the adapter from my PC, then take off running with just the unit? My identity could be given away by the adapter, but it was still better than being captured. Hey, Glee, how you doing? Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the late show, I should say. Or should I stay still right here and wait for them to leave? I'd like to do that if it's possible, but that officer staring at me seemed like he was about to stand up and shout, Hey, you! to me at any moment. The cold sweat dripped on my keyboard. Wait. That woman wouldn't have ratted me out, would she? As I thought of this possibility, I was tortured by a desperate rage. But suddenly, a shadow appeared on the table. It was that woman. More water? She poured me a refill. I cursed her in my heart, wishing that she wouldn't draw their attention towards me at a time like this, and I lowered my face, and my lowered face was totally flushed. 
but a piece of paper with words written on it was attached to the side of the cup she clunked down on the table. Get ready. I nearly raised my head, but the woman quickly left my table before I could make the mistake. I set my computer to mute and shut it down so that it didn't notice that my OS was no longer running. I'll give up on the adapter. I quietly pulled the cord out of the main unit and confirmed the location of my bag. I already used the money I always kept in my jacket pocket at the cafe, so I used what I had in my back pocket. There was a line in, the old, in an old Earth Mafia movie that I saw at home that said that a $10 bill kept in your clothes was a business card to God. It certainly kept you well prepared. I quietly placed a tin mule bill by my hand, perked up my ears, and waited for the right timing. The policeman had been staring at me non-stop. He was definitely suspicious of me. With a clang, the policeman started to get up. Tension up! Ooh. At that moment, the tension dome was placed on the counter loudly. Huh? What's wrong? The cop called out to his partner, who was now halfway out of his seat. Is it the guy behind me? Right after he said this, the woman's voice rang energetically throughout the room. Thanks for waiting. Here's your tension dome. Oh, uh, yeah. The one with his back to me turned his attention to the food. The other one was looking at me, but because the woman was standing next to his corner seat, he was stuck in his seat and couldn't get out. Now was the moment. The woman looked at me. It was my only chance. I pulled my hat over my face, closed my PC with my head still down, grabbed it, and then shoved it into my bag. The payment's on the table. I said this as quietly as possible and left the tin wool pail on the table. Hey, you, wait! The officer clearly told me to stop, but I just gave him a sideways glance as I walked quickly towards the exit. It was only a distance of three steps, but it felt like forever. The yelling officer attempted to chase after me, but the woman was in his way and he couldn't get out. Chia! The shrill scream came from the woman who lost her balance after being pushed by the officer. She turned to the other officer, still sitting in his chair, and the piping hot tension on looked like it was about to spill. Acting out of natural self-defense, the officer caught the ball in his hands. By that time, I had successfully exited the store. I took off running as if nothing else in the world mattered. Ooh. As you thought about this, you became old and died? I think, I think something may have skipped... Think Twitch may have eaten a message? Let me save, actually. I do need to do that. I'm on page two. Yes, overwrite that, because we're further than any place I played anyway. Mm. I'm going to take a quick break. A quick break. Mm, excuse me. And I will be right back.
And I am back. Uh, apologies for that. I had to take a quick look at some things. And now that they have been looked at, I am back to the game. Let me go over here. Take the view. Rename this file and XSplit right quick. Be right back screen. There we go. That way I know exactly what to take off. Um, actually, let me rename this to IAST. And then rename this to AGN. Apologies for this. Apologies for this. Alright. This is still a uh, very new setup. It's one of the extra, it's one of the extra type of stream types. And usually my stream looks a lot different than this, as most, most of you shall, most of those who watch know. It looks much different than this. Anyway, back to the game. I get a quick swig of water, which I should have did while I was on break, but I didn't. My bad. And back here, where am I? I spoke to myself out loud to make sure I wasn't in a dream. My throat was dry, so it was hard to speak. I cleared my throat a few times and took a deep breath. I hadn't the foggiest idea how I got here. After I left that store, I ran for my life towards the narrowest street I could find. I thought the police would be right behind me if I looked back, so I did nothing but run forward, not looking back a single time. After that, I must have found a handy-looking tunnel to hide in and fall asleep inside it. The pain throughout my body must have been from sleeping in the same position the entire time. Is this a sewer? In general, any place made out of the moon's unique limestone was a public facility. This place had also a cool, rough limestone floor, as well as matching walls. Between that and the sound of running water, this place had to be a sewer. Right then, I noticed the slight glow around me. Was that from the exit? It seemed like I had was nearly passed out, and while I had no idea how long I had been asleep, it was, must have been night by now. The fact that the lamps were lit made me certain of it. Slowly and carefully, I began to walk. Then the road suddenly turned into a dead end. I could see the light source on the other side of the wall that I now faced was even taller than me. I let out a quick gasp because it looked as though something on the ceiling had moved. But the only things that were strangely wavering, but the only things there were strangely wavering lights and shadows. Like a small bug attracted to the light, I took my bag off and climbed the wall. Then, what I saw on the other side of the wall, I let out a much bigger gasp. Holy! Before me was a huge, spacious atrium. It was near the top of the atrium, but I could see more passages on its opposite and right sides. However, the most amazing part was the waterway passing through the base of the atrium. Clear water flowed through it like gentle rapids, and most of the sound of water, and most of the sound of water must have originated there. Uh, the bottom of the reservoir glowed a bluish color. Occasionally, a fish would move, and its shadow on the ceiling would swim as well. As I gazed at this scene, amazed that places like this existed on the moon, I suddenly heard a rustling sound behind me. As I turned back in surprise. I forgot that I was balancing on the top of a wall. I immediately lost my balance and fell onto my butt. Ugh. All of a sudden, I saw a pitch black figure in front of me, rifling through my bag. Wh hey! Whoa! What are you doing? Not only had my life's wages and labor gone on to that PC, but it also carried the one billion mool dream that I knew I was going to make a reality. My body moved before I even had time to think, and I tackled the figure. I threw myself at the shadow, covering its face with my left hand and aiming for its throat with my right. It was a technique that an immigrant from Earth taught me when I was growing up in a village full of muscleheads. 
It's an incredible, incredibly effective technique, and it had to be. It was used by someone who came from a place where a failed government was replaced by military forces who had seized the UN food supplies to be used as aid and would toss it around as if it were feeding animals. And because I was looking at the light coming from the waterway, my eyes was, went still to the darkness. The passage was narrow, though, so I couldn't miss. Not only that, but my opponent was way weaker than I had thought, tumbling over as soon as I connected. Right at that moment, I saw a small plank-like object fall onto the floor. The glowing object looked like it could be some sort of computer terminal. However, I was too busy thinking about punishing this idiot who was searching through my bag. On top of the bastard's body, who was either not resisting or too surprised, I kept my grip on the throat and balled my other hand into the tightest fist I could make. Die! I froze, my fist still overhead. Well then, I raised my fist and was about to drop my iron hammer of fury. Uh, uh, I began to speak. A woman? Right then, my vision went dark. I only realized that I had been punched in the nose after I was woken up by being shoved onto the chest, onto the chest, after being shoved on the chest into the side of the wall passage. Hitting me out of nowhere. What's wrong with you? The pitch black shadow, or rather the pitch black woman, began to speak. Black hair, black eyes, black clothes, black skirt, and black shoes. Her ankles, peeking out from the eye hem of her skirt, were black too. Even her stockings were black? Dressed in black from top to bottom? Her white face seemed to float in the darkness. She stared at me with her thin black eyes as she was staring at as if she was staring at a bug. My head was seething, both from the shock of being punched and my anger at the outrageous situation. What the hell? You were the one going through my bag. What's wrong with you? That's not true. What would you do if this broke? The girl looked around, and then while still sitting, she reached out her arms and grabbed the plank-like device that fell earlier. She brushed away the dirt and began to use it, probably to see if it still worked. But anyway, what kind of mentality would lead someone to verbally attack me after hitting me? This is why I hated women. I'm just doing this because I was asked to. Why do I have to be subjugated to the, subjected to this? She seemed to mutter to herself. Disheveled from the fall, she gathered her long hair back into a bundle of darkness in one hand and straightened it neatly in an instant. It looked like a cable harness. Found him. Hurry up and get here. I'm in the side passage at the top level. Still seated, the girl began to talk. That thing might also work as a communication device. Who in the world is she? Was she searching for me? Was she interested in what I was carrying? If that weren't the case, then I wouldn't hold back. Thankfully, it was a dark, deserted, hard to see place. I might have lost a fight just now, but if I went in at her with all my strength, I knew I could win. Maybe I should take some naked pictures of her and post them online once I was done. With that in mind, her arrogant attitude and expression might come in handy. Right as I moved my back off the wall, I heard a voice. I hear you. One minute. The floors get complicated around here. As soon as I heard the voice, I felt the dark urge in my chest disappear. I had heard that voice before. It was the voice of the woman from the Chinese restaurant who allowed me to escape. Hurry up, Lisa. The girl spoke curtly into the terminal. I feel like I'm losing brain cells just being around this guy. I was dumbfounded for a moment and then glared at the girl. Huh? The girl glanced at me, then quickly turned away. She acted as she had been as she heard a stray dog barking outside her window. She was clearly acting in the intolerable way that only women can making it seem as though no insult or abuse hurled her way could possibly affect her. While I was the type to get really angry when something I say is ignored, I was not even i was not even enough of an adult to suppress my irritation. I kept glaring at her, not caring how lame I might be looking. Then, while still glaring, I put my bag out towards me and made sure that nothing had been taken out. Nothing seemed wrong. Only, there seemed to be a something like a piece of dried macaroni at the bottom of my bag. 
It was partially metallic, and a small, green, rice-sized light was flickering all on and off. Around the time that I figured out that it was a homing device, much like you'd use on a pet dog, I heard footsteps on the other side of the mess pas passage. The woman who appeared shortly after was unmistakably the one from the Chinese restaurant. While she was irritating, she also saved me. So this was Lisa. <sighs> Finally found you. I told you the reception is bad around here. The girl in black replied. But I found you. It took a little while, though. The woman wiped her forehead, which made her finally realize that her hair was in a mess. I'm amazed that you got all the way to a place like this. Are you here the whole time? While the woman talked, she took the flat device from the sitting girl. After inputting a few commands, the macaroni-shaped light in my hand stopped blinking and turned yellow. Is this a tracking device? Not answering the woman's question, I asked one back. Yep. I put it out, I put it there when you were bending over to plug your adapter in. You were busy being charmed by my legs, so it was easy to do. I wasn't charmed by anything. I shot back. This only caused the seated back. Seated black clad girl to shoot me a disdainful look over her shoulder. Well, I apologize for putting a homing device in your back without asking. No matter what the reason, it isn't a nice thing to have happen to you. Her easily offered apology left me no room to complain. Only, there was no way that someone could put, who put a tracking device in someone else's bag could be an upstanding person. Considering this, I started to feel like her saving me at the restaurant might have been due to some ulterior motive. In any case, I was in the back corner of a deserted sewer. But what I had just been... What I had just thought of doing in my rage to annoying girl in black might now be done to me. You see, geniuses and the rich were gathered in the lunar cities, and most of them could be called extremely talented. However, they often said that the line between brilliance and madness was paper thin. There was no shortage of stories along the lines of mad scientists performing unspeakable experiments on a nightly basis, or of wealthy perverts committing sickening acts one after the another, one after another. I looked at the woman, the shaking reflection of the water dimly reflected upon her face and grabbed my bag with one hand. I was careful enough to spread my money across different pockets, so of course I can Ooh, excuse me, all that water's getting to me. <clears throat> so of course I carried at least a small weapon. But regardless of gender, the woman over there was taller than me. Gravity was weak on the moon, so if you thought about it, as simple action-reaction, there wasn't much difference here between a man and a woman's punches and kicks. In that case, it came down to either wrestling or stiffening your body in one place and slamming it into your opponent while conserving as much physical energy as possible. And that was where the length of your limbs made a difference. Not only that, there was someone right next to me who most certainly wasn't on my side. I recall the atrium I just looked into. With my leg strength, couldn't I jump over the wall all the way to over to the other side? Or if I made sure to land in the water, wouldn't I be okay? While my mind was worrying through the possibilities, I gulped and said the following. Why are you doing this? Was your saving me a trap? I wasn't sure if I should say that much, but before I could make a decision, the woman spoke first. Eh... <laughs> The woman smiled as if she was stumped and bent her head to her side. She then continued. For fun? My back stiffened with a shudder. I had the feeling that I was going to be killed. You've got to be kidding me. I still had dreams, and I had just barely gotten to the starting line. I stood up and suddenly put all my strength into my thigh muscles. She spoke right as my body began to fly up. But I mean, you wouldn't want to get falsely arrested, right? Unable to drain all the strength of my thighs, my body floated as I hopped lightly backwards. With a slow, gentle tra trajectory, my back tapped against the wall. Wait, falsely arrested? That's right. Those two officers were chasing after a boy, age 15 to 17, height around 160 centimeters, slender, black hair, black eyes, Asian features, wearing a black backpack. 
But isn't that him? The girl in black replied to this description. That's what I thought too. But after talking to them some more, I realized that it was someone else. I was slightly confused. When did I get asked that? That woman had known for a long time that I was a runaway. I'd been going out in and out of that restaurant for a while and I'd met her a number of times. Running away from home as a minor was technically against the law. While it's not something you'd be punished for, it was assumed that the public order would be deteriorated by jobless, penniless minors wandering the streets, and so they're cracked down on. And that's why the woman's words didn't make sense to me. Confused and with my back still against the wall, I heard the woman let out a small sigh and continue to talk. Those two, ki those two officers weren't just looking for some runaway kid. They were after a thief. Um, no, I'm not voice acting. I'm just reading. I'm reading. I'm just, well, technically I am voice acting, yeah. But yeah, I'm just reading the text. And hello, Weed Goku. How you doing? Those two officers weren't looking for just some runaway kid. They were after a thief. Yeah, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad, no. <laughs> Thief? That's right. But well, consider. Well, I know. I'm not a very good girl, am I? <laughs> um, I don't think my voice can fit for a girl. In fact, it can't fit for a young boy either. That's right. But well, considering his MO, and the circumstances, I could see someone like you could be, a sex, could be a suspect. Hearing this, I was reminded of how persistent the woman was when it came to most random things. And that's why you wouldn't stop asking me whether or not I had lunch. Exactly. The other day, someone stiffed the nearby restaurant on the bill. According to eyewitnesses, the suspect looked just like... <laughs> well, I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. I am, I am definitely glad you're enjoying yourself. Feel free to give a follow if you want. Um, cause I do do, I do do visual novel streams quite frequently. Yeah, a boy gets a beast of a PC and he still does visual novels all the time. Go figure. Exactly. The other day, someone stiffed a nearby restaurant on the bill. Turn British? I didn't even notice that. Well, thank you for the follow, and welcome to the Legion. Usually I'd have a pop-up somewhere. Actually, can I still do it? Can I still do it right quick? Put that there. Start. It, it might show up. It just might show up. Hold on. If it shows up, I'll let it, it'll come up there soon. Yeah, I have two setups. <laughs> uh, I, this setup is for the non-relaxed stream, where I usually have the camera on and the whole things and all this going on, chat on the screen and everything. It just might show itself. If it doesn't, then oh well. But thank you for the follow. I did get the email notification, so thank you. Exactly. The other day, someone stiffed a nearby restaurant on the bill. According to eyewitnesses, the suspect looked like someone like you, as usual. But, well, I didn't think that someone who would order IU jelly with a carefree, satisfied expression on his face right after gobbling up a crab fried rice would do something like that, you know? The woman giggled as she said this. Slightly miffed, I glared back at her. I wouldn't do something dirty like that over something like ten mules. Of course not. I checked with Seralt, too. Oh, and I made sure to hold on to your, your change in your adapter. That made me feel a little relieved. The adapter was especially important. If you were smart enough, you could do just about anything with an electric appliance, so most purchases required showing personal identification. If my adapter were to get returned, the police... If my adapter were to get returned, the return to the police as a lost article, they figured out my they figure out my identity in a snap. Yeah, I don't think it's showing. Aw. Must have missed it. Oh well. 
If my adapter were to get returned, the police, uh, oh god, this line. I, I hate, I hate when, I hate when some of these visual novels need like a second pass through on editing. After release. <laughs> my adapter were to get returned to the police as a lost article, they'd figure out my- they'd figure out my identity in a snap. Let me skip this thing. I heard that on Earth, even a child could anonymously- anonymously buy parts that could easily be made into a cutting-edge missile. Now that was a scary place. So, well, that's what's going on. You should come back to my place. I honestly could not understand what she was saying. What? Are you thinking of going back to that cafe? I asked Sir Walt and he said that four stern looking guys are tur taking turns patrolling that place. It wasn't a result that was hard to predict. Only, if that's the case, then I'd be back to sleeping on the hard ground of some deserted area. To be honest, doing that took a big toll on my body. Not being able to get a calm night's sleep was the worst part about this police patrol. As far as getting sleep, the Big Bull Cafe had a roof and running water. And if you said, and if you said that you wanted to pay the premium fee, you'd get the sense of security that came with knowing that you'd be alerted if something dangerous started to go down. The question was whether or not that's a reason to just jump on an invitation with some suspicious woman who put tracking devices in people's bags for fun. Even in a stock exchange, a too-good-to-be-true balance sheet was sometimes used to prime the pump right before a huge crash. I understand why you might be suspicious. But, I just told you, right? It's like a hobby for me. The woman told me this as I remained doubtful. Bringing runaways like me into your home was a hobby? She's either a pervert with some bizarre hobbies, or could it be my charm? I think I basically know what you're thinking, but... <laughs> the woman then laughed in amazement. Unfortunately for you, boys younger than me aren't my thing. Unless they're holding giant blood-soaked scissors. Uh, well, then what? What are you after? Is it money? As soon as she said these words, a smile disappeared from the woman's eyes. Did she get mad? Just from that? Well, I had the feeling that I had already said a lot of other things that should have made her angry. I was still surprised at the sudden change. Watching my face, the woman must have realized the change in her expression. Oh, well, I'm sorry. She spoke in a forced tone, then rubbed the area around her eyes gently with both hands. This completely disarmed and confused me. Not only that, I was faced with the grim reality of not having any place to go. The woman in front of me allowed me to escape from the restaurant, so in that sense, I owed her a lot. I then concluded that aside from the part about being a runaway, I did consider myself a decent human being, so I should probably reply with something like this. If I do end up being a burden on you, I won't be able to pay much, you know? While I had realized that she wasn't especially interested in my money, I still had enough decency to feel bad about not paying someone who took care of me. And that's why I said what I said. Would she understand? As I kept staring at the woman, she finally grinned and nodded. Of course. I'll take a little for food and other costs, but it should still be a lot better than wandering around outside. Oh, and the woman continued. After all, I took care of Seralt, too. Huh? Nothing you should worry about. So, what did you do? There's nothing else I could do. There was only one way I could answer. Thanks. Hmm. You should be more honest and just say that from the beginning. The woman continued to smile as she said that, but I told her in my head to be more reasonable. Okay. Let's go. Let Then let's go back. If it gets much later, I won't have a good excuse to give to the police. Hearing the word police, I nodded, once again recognizing the precarious situation I was in. However, while both the women... women while both the woman and I tried to set off, there was someone who wouldn't budge an inch. It was the girl dressed in black. And while I wasn't sure if she was listening to my conversation with the woman or not, she had an absent-minded look on her face. What are you doing? The woman asked. It was a very pertinent question. 
The girl, while still not answering, turned her head and stared my way. Her utterly conceited expression immediately reminded me of the irritating argument I just had with her. What? I said this to her with a voice full of anger. I knew that my remark would be ignored or snubbed, but she was being so upsetting that it came out that way. Then, as I expected, the girl turned away snootily, but with all the annoying elegance of some sort of princess. Hagana, you're not trying to throw a tantrum like a child, are you? The woman used the name Hagana to refer to the girl. Still snootily turned away, the girl called Hagana gave no reply. With this, I was roughly able to guess what I was going on. The woman inviting me to her house was most likely meant that I would be living under the same roof as this obnoxious girl named Hagana. Naturally, I was upset that I had be that I had been openly rejected by her, but taking a step back, I suppose I could understand how Hagana felt. This put me at a bit of a loss. Should I get angry or should I respond like an adult? Only, this wasn't the time or place to dawdle. As I was about to say that I didn't even mind sleeping in the garden, she spoke first. I can't stand up. What? Hagana looked at the woman who replied to her and continued. I can't put any strength into my hips. It's because he tackled me. Hagana looked at me as she said this. The woman looked at me. You tackled her? Really? I vaguely recalled something like this happening in kindergarten or elementary school teacher so-and-so tackled someone or another. But I was not one to use violence without reason. If the girl in black looked over in response to a sound and saw someone searching over her own bag, wouldn't she have done the same thing? But right as I went to say this, I'm faced with the fact that I tackled a delicate girl and began to realize that I had done something that was hard to make an excuse for. <sighs> Women are such unfair creatures. I cursed the black-clad and white-skinned Hagana as a shrewd tactician. I guess so. Wait, no, but... But, no, I can imagine the situation. In that case, in a fight, both parties are to blame. The, women, the woman said this, then pointed at Hagana. Hagana looked at the tip of the finger as if it were covered in some kind of sweet syrup. If you can't walk, then have him carry you on his back. The woman's finger then pointed at me. Still attracted by the finger, Hagana's gaze shifted to me. But wait, how's that punishment for the both of us? That doesn't make sense. While I protested, the woman just lightly raised her eyebrows, as if to insist that I listen to her. This was blatant favoritism, I thought. After all, the person she's saying has to be carried must also. I began to think, then realized. Ah, in a fight, both parties were to blame. Okay, hurry up if you understand. This wasn't just any ordinary woman. Hagana also made a face as though she had come to some sort of realization, then nodded. I sighed, put my bag on my front side, and walked up towards Hagana. She was sitting down, so her face was in a somewhat erotic position. Hagana hadn't made particular expressive faces to begin with and stared up at me motionlessly. Sadistic desires began to well up in me, thinking that I'd feel a lot better if I slapped the side of her face as hard as I could. However, I felt as though if I dwelt on these thoughts for too long, I might actually slap her. So I quickly crouched down and turned my back to her. I wasn't sure how long it'd take, but living under the same roof as her seemed like it'd be a pain, at least until the friction between us settled down. I should avoid any potential points of conflict. Come on, Hagana. Turn your arms, that's right. I tried to give Hagana, who seemed to be telling the truth about not being able to stand, a hand and climbing on my back. Hagana's thin arms wrapped around my neck and then stiffened awkwardly. Actually, it seemed like this girl had never climbed on someone's back. Hagana, you're not going to be dangling from his neck. You're getting on his back. The woman explained, and after a bit of silence, Hagana shifted her body onto my back. But finally... Two small but soft objects touched my back. Then, as I'm responsible for carrying her, my hands wrapped around the bottom of Hagana's thighs. I was filled with a strange thought. So this is what a leg in stockings felt like. Shit, it's not bad. Okay. Stand. 
Another part of me nearly rose as well, but with a quick start, I put my strength into my two legs. <laughs> Let me... Is my channel up? Is my channel up? Let me get that right quick. Let me get that right quick. That that is a a highlight moment. There we go. I'll create a. There we go. Okay. Good lord. I hadn't been skipping my resistance training, so I could pretty easily carry up to around five times my weight. One slender girl was practically nothing to me. Oh, you're stronger than I thought. The praise didn't feel too bad. All right, then let's go. The woman began to walk. I tried to follow behind her, but Hagana stopped me. Wait. Hmm? The woman turned back, and we both looked at Hagana's face. Hers was right next to mine. Suddenly, I smelled something sweet and fruit-like for a moment. What is it? As the woman replied, Hagana raised her head a little while still on my back and replied quietly. He really stinks. The woman looked blankly at Hagana, then at me. A strange, cheerful smile began to appear on her face. In a fight, both parties are to blame. I'm going to make her bow down to me one day. At that moment, I added another item to my list of ambitions. Here. No. I always forget it's not that. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna take another quick break, right quick. Another quick break. Let me see how much I've been up. All right, about almost two hours. Not bad, not bad. So I'm gonna take another quick, very quick break. Uh, maybe not more than five minutes at the most. That is kind of quick. I will be back.
And I am back. I am back. Let's get back to a little bit more of this visual novel. Yes, I'm, I'm actually quite enjoying it, too. I hope you are, too. Okay. It seemed as though the place I tumbled into after running like mad wasn't a sewer. It was, more precisely, a reservoir. As Newton City was designed to gather everything, including people, water, and wealth, if there happened to be a problem with the city's water circulation facilities, there was a fear that the low-lying Newton City could flood. <clears throat> for that reason, there were apparently two additional layers of facilities for long-term water storage, so that water went from the outer sections to Green City, then from Green City to Newton City. While I didn't know the first thing about this, I did know that I was in a place with an incredibly fantastic atmosphere, and that was why other towns generally forbid entry into these reservoirs. It's because couples that get together tend to be drawn towards places like that. I'm not in agreement with this observation. Also, this area seemed to be quite a low-income neighborhood, even by the standards of the 6th outer section, and it was full of homes on the verge of collapsing, even here on the gravity-weak moon. Even so, the many lights in the town made it easy to recognize that lots of people lived here. For a town in the outer sections, this one was relatively old. Apparently, it used to be more lively in the past. And as it was also night, there was nothing, there was almost nothing there related to liveliness. Actually, it looked like a scene out of some children's tale from long, long ago. This place wasn't a reality, but rather ruins from the real world overlapping with the glory of days past. That's how the place looked to me. But every once in a while, someone would go out of the ease of their home under an imitation stars projected on the dome and amuse themselves by drinking alcohol or by playing a game of chess or go. It may have been a poor area, but it seemed incredibly safe. They say that it was an old town, which must have meant that its residents had stopped developing the area. Newton City had developed at a rate that threatened to surpass even the most advanced nations on Earth, so some of the people that have been attracted to it worked so hard that you could refresh the list of humanity's rich, richest people and see changes every day. To put it another way, the people who decided not to compete became comparatively poorer by the day. Getting poorer under capitalism meant that you're being forced that much further into the big, back in the big race. Not only that, I didn't want to become one of the masses, but if I failed, I'd, then I'd end up like these people. Hagana had finally stopped calling me smelly. I rearranged her position on my back, then asked myself a question sternly. Are we still not there yet? No matter how light they may be, people aren't the easiest thing to carry on one's back, especially when it's a girl you were carrying and you have to watch where you put your hands. Hearing my question, Lisa looked over her shoulder and nodded lightly. As I wa as I sighed, nothing as I sighed, thinking that we still had more to go, Lisa's feet suddenly stopped. We're here. Hearing those words, I stopped my feet and raised my head. Wonder, I wondered what kind of run-down hut we'd arrived at, but to my surprise, I was facing an impressive gate. Actually, wasn't this a bit too impressive of a gate? Two meters? Three meters? Wait, more importantly, wasn't this? As I stood so dumbfounded that I forget that Hakana was in my back, Lisa put a hand on the gate and slowly pushed it open. It didn't even seem to be locked. But, considering what this place was, I could understand. Standing in front of me was a building that I'd only ever heard of before. Sheltering people is my hobby. Do you see why now? She opened the double doors and walked in. The next thing I knew, a bearded dude stuck on a cross was right in front of me. Welcome to the 6th Avenue Church. Lisa said this to me while I was still in shock. You, you're a crisist? Not crisis, Christian. 
I thought that was something they only did on Earth. This was supposed to be a place on the, foreign mo on the forefront of science and human advancement. Why was there a church here? Or, or could it be that people from Earth, this place, far away in the sky, was supposed to be heaven? As I looked at Lisa as if she were some exotic animal, she gave a slightly embarrassed grin and shook her head. Well, I suppose you would say that, but don't worry. I'm not going to try to convert you or anything. Huh? After a long silence, all I could manage was a puff of laughter through my nose. According to my faith, all I need to do is to let lost sheep rest for a short time. It's the same thing for that girl on your back. I'd forgotten I was carrying Haganah. Hey, we're here, so I'm going to let you down. Hurry up and let me down. I felt a flash of anger, but since I was holding on to both of her legs, I figured in the end it was a very natural thing to do. Though I was overwhelmed by the temptation to just let her go, I bent my knees slowly and let her down, one foot at a time. You can stand? Ghana was silent, but she seemed to be amazed that she was standing. What a strange woman. So, what were we saying? Oh, so she's a runaway too? Right. The same idea with Sirot. This place is a crossroads, and so, according to the teachings, I have a bucket of for washing feet and a cup of cold water ready to give you. Feet? Water? I made a face as to say, what is this woman even talking about? Lisa saw it, and instead of getting angry, she breathed a disappointed sigh. Do you happen to be born and bred on the moon? Yes, but so what? After I asked this back to her, Lisa shook her head, disappointed. Was she making fun of me? Was that what it was? As I glared at her, Lisa looked towards the statue of the dude stuck on her cross, placed her hands together and bowed her head. Oh Lord, you have brought me to great trial. Then as she said this, she made a strange gesture with her right hand in front of her body. As I was wondered what she was doing, Lisa faced me and began to speak. For now, why don't you take a bath? I'm not trying to be Hagana, but you are a little dirty. Being told this to my face was actually a bit embarrassing. Well, I'm sorry. As I said this, trying to hide my embarrassment, Hagana, who had been watching the situation quietly, picked up where Lisa left off. In fact, you smell terrible. After that, I began to be especially conscious of my own body. That day, I realized I was at a far more emotional and innocent age than I had thought. It was the first proper bath I'd had since running away from home, and I was on the verge of tears. Both my parents were immigrants from Japan, and so soaking in the tub was pretty much a daily tradition. It would be the only luxury my parents enjoyed, if I had to think of anything. You could find water circulating all over the lunar surface, but you definitely couldn't say water was inexpensive because of that. I heard that the reason they made water flow visibly everywhere was because water had a calming effect on the human soul. Even if that weren't true, I heard that all but a few places on Earth were short of water, and that half of international disputes stemmed from water resource issues. Perhaps the visible presence of water was to put some of the immigrants' anxieties to rest, since they believed that fights over water resources were an everyday occurrence due to their coming from various regions on Earth. However, what I was currently soaking in was apparently water siphoned off before final processing, and thus it was quite cheap. At the bottom of the tub I could see pieces of aquatic plants used for water purification like I see in waterways. It wasn't just water that was limited on the moon. Unlike Earth, the moon didn't have vast quantities of various resources. Most of them were created from chemical processing of native lunar materials, or, failing that, imported via the orbital elevator. That's why people said that the government organization in charge of managing the lunar surface had terribly precise control over the flow of various materials throughout the day. If you want, draw, hold on. Let me make sure I can... Sound resumed. Microphone activated. There you go. Although I will be reading, so uh, I, I won't... Uh, I, I don't care if you join the TS. I will be reading mostly, though. I mean, it is a visual novel. <laughs> User joined your channel. Hey, draw. 
Hey. All right. I will be reading mostly, but if you want to talk a little bit, we can. What are you playing? A uh, World End Economica. Ooh, that's one of the ones I actually wanted to play myself. Yeah, it it's really good. Yeah, Art it's looked amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm really liking it so far. It's it's a bit of a read and it's a bit of an exercise for my mouth, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's definitely uh, those. yeah, it's it's definitely an exercise for my mouth. And, and for my tongue, I, I need to, if I'm going to start reading a lot again, I'm going to need to train my tongue again. Linear, 2014. It's an exercise for my mouth. <laughs> Not in that way. <laughs> anyway, yeah, let me get back to reading right quick. That's why people said that the government organization in charge of managing the lunar surface had terribly precise control over the flow of various materials throughout the city. The most important of those was water, and thus the amount of oxygen and hydrogen. Any amount of oxygen could be attained by using the plentiful amount of solar radiation to break down silicon di dioxide, sand, in other words. Hydrogen, however, could only be attained via hydrocarbons that only existed at the poles. Hydrogen is too light for the moon's gravity to retain it, and thus naturally occurring hydrogen was quite rare. Carbon could be attained could be a carbon could be obtained by using the limitless electrical power here to break down solid carbon dioxide shipped in from oh god shipped in. shipped in from the orbital elevator. Oxygen could also be obtained from this process, thus killing two birds with one stone. And nitrogen and the various minerals needed for the growth of plants and animals could only be obtained through chemical pellets transported in through the orbital elevator. This basic knowledge was supposedly taught to all kids in elementary school during science classes. Unfortunately, I hadn't really applied myself in school and thus had to learn it much later. What got me to learn about this was when I first started seriously trading stocks and wanted to figure out who had the best slice of the pie when it came to various systems on the moon. I had naively thought that investing in that would guarantee smooth sailing and that would be that. I had learned a lot while operating under that notion and thus it wasn't all the rose-tinted stuff they teach you at school. I remember sighing in awe at the systems revolving around rights tied to the important resources in lunar cities. The public parts were, of course, controlled by the government. But the most powerful on the civilian side had to be the Emerald Industries, which held the civilian rights to the orbital elevator. By the way, if you were wondering about why the company was named after Emeralds, it was because a long time ago people said that the moon's core were ma was made of Emerald. It was originally a maintenance company, but since this was such a complicated piece of machinery, there weren't many qualified guys who could work on it. This was a textbook example of what would happen if they were also quite crafty. The majority of the infrastructure on the moon was under the umbrella of Emerald Industries and its related subsidiary companies. During the time it took for me to come out of the bathroom, dry myself off, and put on the obviously old t-shirt and pants, I must have interacted with products from 100 to 200 of Emerald Industries' various subsidiaries. This was a totally artificial city. So artificial it would put Las Vegas and Dubai to shame, even though those were lauded as cities with fountains in the desert. Now, I hadn't seen either city with my own eyes, but I'd seen footage of them. People on Earth sure were idiots, I thought candidly to myself. All freshened up? When I came out of the changing room, Lisa was lying back on the sofa. There was a cup of water she poured for me for on the table. The changing room connected straight into the living room, in it was an old and worn sofa set that she sofa set that she must have picked up from a dump somewhere, along with a coffee table and a carpet whose corners must have been mended countless times. There was no TV, but there was a computer. Also, on the coffee table was a multifunctional multifunction terminal that Lisa had been using just now. What it surprised me was the thick book next to it. It was a rare event to see real books on the moon, where space and resources were limited. Uh, Glee, you mean the, uh, 
the thing where it says like high or medium or low if not if if so then i need probably need to be around like 40 viewers for that to actually activate the encode the transcoding settings yeah unless i actually have transcoding settings which i kind of would doubt but if they are there then there you go be what partner have 40 to 100 viewers at a single time yeah i mean and getting partner while some people would say for them it was easy for most it's not <laughs> I saw a guy the other day that had only been streaming for two months, had only had, he had 50,000 views and uh, like 600 followers and he was a partner. He had just got it. Well then. That's interesting. I mean, I'm not too far behind in follows. Way ahead in, in views. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, wow. Um, who knows? Maybe it is. The oh. person that comes into uh, indies and uh, like our streams sometimes. Really? Yeah. Holy crap. Maybe it's gotten easier. Because I checked out the partner thing, the what they said up there in order to get partner. Because, you know, I was looking into a whole group thing. And it said, like, have. 500 like 500 something viewers can to see you consistently i'm like what i don't i think those rules are either old or they're old because i mean i don't think aside from when like indy was doing on put on the front page he hardly ever had that many in a single time yeah he, he never had that the video keeps buffering that sucks let me check to make sure I didn't up the quality of the, That's uh... That's a lot of text, and it was all black background, so that was fantastic. Oh, okay. No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have... I'd... That's probably because there is currently... I think, is the Dota 2 tournament still going on? Even if it isn't, Twitch's service could still be messed up from that. Think so. Um, but yeah, the, the video buffering is on Twitch's side, unfortunately. I I could try and stop and restart the stream, but I haven't dropped. Well, I have dropped a hundred frames, but that's out of a hundred and eighty thousand plus. Hmm. I really am sorry that it's, uh, acting up for you, Glee. What it surprised me was the thick book next to it. It was a rare event to see real books on the moon, where space and resources were limited. I had thought, of until, I had thought until rel relatively recently that books were simply an application interface format. I didn't realize that things that resembled what was drawn on the screen actually existed. Hey, Duchess, how's it going? I am doing great. Just reading a visual novel right now. And, uh, enjoying myself a little greatly. How about you? People... I played Cards Against Humanity with her the other night. Ooh, nice. And yeah, since she brought it... She hawk And she what? It hasn't buffered since you brought it up. Well then, isn't that a good thing, Glee? The people who come from Earth made fun of people who grew up on the moon for things like that. Awesome as always, that's what I like to hear now. <laughs> However, from my point of view, people from Earth were the ones who had something messed up in their heads, since they still stuffed these ridiculously bulky, bulk, bulky books into places like libraries. Is it rare to see a real book? I came to when Lisa asked me a question. Once more, she had the no multi-function terminal in her hand, most likely reading a book again. Well, even if I had snapped back saying that I don't know what I don't know, 
You're treating me like some naive idiot would piss me off. That is Drawl. This is Drawl and the team speak with me. And thus I mumbled my reply while putting on a poker face. But Lisa didn't make fun of me. Well, they certainly take up space. They also get dirty easily, so you'd have to take real good care of them. Furthermore, you couldn't really search them, so the digital version is a hundred times better. I instantly realized she was doing this out of consideration for me. It was as if she was some kindergarten teacher. Oh yeah. I should play that one day. Because I've never played it before, I don't know how to actually. Uh, I instantly realized she was doing this out of consideration for me. It was as if she were some kindergarten teacher who had a good idea of what would cause immigrants from Earth and moonbred kids to get into a fight. And that is? I pointed at the thick but worn book on the table. There were some gold-colored alphabet-looking characters on the back cover, but I couldn't quite parse them. B B I B L This to me was the most important book in the world, and thus I brought it with me from Earth. Just wing it. <laughs> Alright then. One day it shall be done. It shall be winged. Even though I parted with Julie, who had been been with me since the day I was born. Oh, she's my pet dog, by the way. Even if I parted with Julie, I couldn't bear to leave that book back on Earth. <clears throat> Lisa said the mobile terminal. Lisa led. Mm. Lisa laid the mobile terminal aside and carefully stroked the front cover of the tattered book. Upon seeing that, I flashed back to when I was a naive kid being patted on the head by my parents' hands, roughened from working outdoors. When did you come here from Earth? We got chased out of our place when I was 11. With that, my parents made the bold move to apply for lunar immigration. We didn't really have the money and thus would have to apply through the commoners category, which has ridiculous odds. Well, my parents' professions were kind of special and since the NOAA system was still in effect, we managed to get placed into a prefectural category. NOAA system? Ah, it was how people referred to the system for the preservation of multiculturalism. Well, I guess you wouldn't know about it unless you were involved with it. Or there was a story about Noah's Ark. Well, there was some legend or oral tradition or teaching or whatever that talked about how when the world had turned to evil and was destroyed by a huge flood, good people and pairs of animals rode out on flood in a boat and went on to create a virtuous world after water receded. Something like that. My parents were both theological scholars I guess they needed people of that odd profession as well. This was the first time I had heard the term theological scholar. Lisa picked up the nearby terminal and showed me the dictionary entry. They were apparently people who studied religious teachings. I was surprised, I was truly surprised that people who gave up their lives to such useless things were here on the moon. And thus this book was like my soul. For someone like me who had been raised in a, such a household there were many authors depending on which chapter it was, but it was mostly written around 2,000 years ago. It's actually the best-selling book on Earth, you know. Oh? Huh? It's that interesting? Lisa laughed out loud when I started to show a bit of interest in the book while looking at it. <laughs> oh no, sorry. Well, if you asked me whether it was interesting or not, I'd say it was interesting in its own way. But it isn't really that kind of a book. This is called the Bible. Remember the figure you saw in the church? This was the book written by the disciples of the guy pinned up there. It's a book of religious teaching, so to speak. They estimate that over one billion copies have been sold. A billion copies? It's because it would be found everywhere on earth. It was translated into the words spoken by people all over the earth. Hmm? Gotta work, of course, of course. 
You get your rest now, Duchess. Thanks for showing up. I do appreciate it. So in other words, everyone on Earth reads it? If only that were the case. A question mark appeared on my face when I heard Lisa's reply. The Earth's population is roughly 6.5 billion. Even in an age where 700,000 of those people of those could come to the moon, roughly a third of the people on Earth couldn't read, and two-thirds had no surroundings where they could sit down and read a book. Of course, get your beauty sleep. Good night. The Earth, uh, book. The remaining fortunate one-third had tons of other forms of entertainment. There were few people reading the Bible nowadays, even among Christians. Even at the church I attended, there were few people who knew there were four books that comprised the Gospels, and even less people knew the names of the four authors. You probably don't understand how sad this fact is. Sorry, I totally don't have a clue there. Well, that's alright. I've already got a heavy load due to having to carefully watch over this old church. Still, knowledge passes on when people cross paths. Trivia used to refer to wisdom, and the word's original meaning was that of a three-way intersection, where people would cross paths. And had a three-way what now? Intersection. I wondered what would be the point of having all these lost people meeting at such an intersection. It was perhaps a sign that I realized I should be a shepherd, a herder of sheep. A shepherd? I've seen images of sheep being herded by sirens and electrical fences before while researching certain p potential investment candidates. But how is this related to managers of those factories? Seeing me totally drawing a blank, Lisa laughed weakly and said, Sorry, it's just a metaphor. I actually haven't seen a real shepherd either. I guess it was, wasn't just a matter of not knowing stuff because I was born on the moon. I was at least a bit relieved by that. I'm pretty much that type of person. People would certainly wonder why I came to the moon to do such a thing. Well, I do think that. Lisa chuckled at my frank statement. Well, now let's talk about you, okay? Since you went to the trouble of saving me from the police, Bringing me here since it looked like I had no place to go, and even letting me take a bath, my good character dictated that I answer her. I come from a settlement village on the outskirts of the eastern outer district. Oh? Uh, that great place with all the greenery, right? Outsiders all say that, isn't it just because we're all from the Stone Age? <laughs> well, people who had come to the moon were all city dwellers back when they were on Earth. They missed their greenery. I was beginning to feel that I was being blanketed and confused by a high level of logic. Are the cities on Earth full of greenery then? Well, I guess the way I worded it was kind of bad. Even on Earth there wasn't that much greenery in the cities. For some reason people were attracted to the natural outdoors from times long past. Perhaps it's something ingrained in us, aren't you the same? I was about to refute her point, but decided against it. In either case, I ran away from a home over there. Okay, your name is? Is it okay to ask? Lisa asked me without showing any signs of trying to force me. Like I'd be able to get away with not answering that if I said no. It's fine if you don't want to. But it would be kind of inconvenient to call for you, so I'd like some sort of a name. The girl you carried on her back, she's called Hagana. That's not her real name. Eh? Well, it's not like she doesn't want to open up to me, but she's like a wild animal in that she's very cautious about things. Hagana is originally a word from the language of the Wanderers. Well, actually, does anything come to mind when I use the term Wanderers? No idea. I guess that's to be expected, but I see. I guess the Moonbred being free from Earth had this kind of meaning. Sorry, talking to myself again. It's my first time talking to a kid who was born and bred on the moon. People born and bred on the moon. There's still probably not even 10,000 or so. The people working in Newton City said that it was due to the fact that many people weren't able to have children. 
Most of the people who came from Earth were 10 years old at the youngest when they rode the orbital elevator. There was a huge difference in gravity between the moon and the Earth, and thus there were issues with their bodies. Of course, to them, Earth was their birthplace, and the common sense they possessed came from there as well. Well, this is really is like trivia. The whole paths crossing and exchanging wisdom thing. Lisa smiled with satisfaction while uttering those words. If Agana, that girl clad in black, could be considered strange, then Lisa must also be strange for helping and harboring me. Anyhow, even in this day and age and living on the moon, she's all into religion and cherishes her real books. To put it bluntly, I wondered if she was a social outcast. However, I had a favorable impression of Lisa, even though she didn't seem to take part in the competitions that raged on in this competitive city. It was true that she wasn't pushing ahead, but it didn't feel like she was falling back either. Even in this low gravity environment, Lisa appeared to have her feet planted firmly on the ground. She looked to me as if she was just enjoying her life. I was a bit moved seeing that people like that actually existed. Now I had thought that there were three types of people on the moon. The rough and crude from my village who were fined only in speech. The decadent people from the outer sections who couldn't be helped. And the residents of Newton City who took advantage of the low gravity to jump up to lofty heights. These were my thoughts as I looked at Lisa who was smiling happily to herself. It feels like she could just be trusted. Yoshiharu. Hmm? Eh? Kawara Yoshiharu. Oh, your name. It's my real name, so if you report me, they quickly notify my parents. After my blunt answer, Lisa looked at me for a moment. Then a smile spread over her face. I see. Got it. How about just how? Huh? Even if I called you by your first name, wouldn't it really narrow down who you are? It would be obvious you were a kid of Japanese immigrants. If it were just how, then that wouldn't be an issue. Of course, there wasn't really any reward for turning someone in, but the fact that someone didn't do it from the get-go was also a bit creepy. This was a good thing for me, but suspicion had become a daily thing with my three months of wandering around. Issa noticed the look of suspicion on my face and said, <laughs> Well, if this were Earth, I could just say, The Lord's will be done, and smile, and everyone would accept it. Totally have no clue what you're talking about. Well, that's true. This is the moon, after all. Although sometimes I start getting the urge to put one of those on. That was what she said, and I wonder what she meant. Though, from her expression, she'd probably just dodge the question if I asked her. However, it pains me that it's Hagana who'd fit better in them. It looks like my hair color's too bright. Lisa talked to herself while brushing her hair with her fingers. It wasn't on Hagana's level, but I thought she had beautiful straight hair. Back in the village, everyone placed blonde women on a pedestal, but I kind of like girls with a deeper colored hair. To put it bluntly, like someone who's in front of me right now. Speaking of which, I wonder what that girl's doing now. It's almost time to sleep, but perhaps she wasn't planning on taking a bath? And right after she said that, I heard a door open on the other side. I Oh god, I feel... I just suspect... it. That's coming, isn't it? Ah, as if someone was waiting just for the moment when Lisa was about to get up from the sofa. Supposedly, there were only Lisa and Hagana here, so logically, it must have been Hagana. So there was no reason to get surprised, but I did get a shock when I spotted Hagana coming in from the dark hallway. Knew it! Freaking knew it! Hey, Hagana! Lisa got up hurriedly from the sofa. The Hagana in question squinted her eyes, wearing a surprised, puzzled expression. And her hands were ridiculously needed, fo neatly folded pajamas, and what looked like a change of underwear, but what got us all in a fluster was her appearance. She was wearing short sleeves that revealed her slender long legs, short short shorts, that revealed her slender long legs all the way up to her hips, and a sleeveless t-shirt 
which, through which you could almost see her chest. Haven't I told you times never to wander around in something like that? Isn't it fine since it's not showing? She replied, surprised at how angry Lisa was, and went quickly into the changing room. It looked like Lisa couldn't figure out what to say and simply growled in front of the changing room door. As for me, to my great distress, I read at my eyes and thought, her panties are white? That was an oddly childlike, that was oddly childlike compared to the color of her clothing and her ridiculous chickly cheekiness. Well, it wasn't bad, but seeing that kind of underwear beneath her totally black stockings would kind of be a letdown, I thought to myself. I then noticed Lisa glaring at me. Erase that from your memory. I couldn't just brush it off by laughing at her ridiculously serious face because of her scary glare. I nodded twice obediently. She, she's because she's so hard-headed. Lisa sighed and shook her head. Even though it looked like she had all the power here, she had no way of controlling Hagana's thoughts. It really did seem like Lisa's hobby was to shelter runaways. That was fine, but I felt inclined to show her respect for her words. It was a strange thing. You also make sure to leave at least some sense of shame too, you know? Okay? It was the first time I had ever heard that in my life, but I nodded. I possessed manners that would lead people to think I seriously wanted to distance myself from the crude culture of my home village, where people who couldn't get naked in front of people of the same gender were considered cowardly. However, Lisa not waited for my nod and added an additional line. I'm looking forward to your manners the next time we eat. I what a cheap move, I mentally yelled at Lisa. I guess in the end, this lady was the type to take you by surprise if you let your guard down. Lisa was me laughing merrily as she returned to the sofa and started playing with her multifunction terminal. I had already taken a bath, but I wasn't quite sleepy yet, so I sat on the floor at once and opened my PC. A bit afterwards, there was a quarrel between Hagana and Lisa. Hagana figured that since we were facing the other way and engrossed in what we were doing, she could just walk back to her room with only a towel on her shoulder, whereas Lisa tried to push her back into the changing room. Lisa was frantic, saying that this had been a place with better manners before, but I thought perhaps it was a warmer place before because it was just two females living together. I felt that I had come across a great place. Even though we had separate rooms, they were all well cleaned. If helping people out like that was a hobby, then this unhealthy interest in this church thing and this crucified man was probably also not a bad thing. And now that it's come to morning, I'm actually going to quit the stream for tonight. Um, because, well, frankly, I'm tired, and it's almost... 11.30 my time. Let's see how long I've been up. Almost two and a half hours, so that's not bad. Not bad at all. That's more than the two hours than I normally try to give, so... Yeah. That is good. Let me... I saved. And I have one more thing to add here. And that would be a screen media file for my end. For my ending. Put that there. But it needs to go under. Under the game. Let me nickname it end. End title. In the title. There we go. There we go. It's been a pleasure. I hope everybody who was listening enjoyed themselves. And this is Lolinia signing out. Peace. The game is interesting. Yeah, it is. It really is.